Welcome back to Senate Education, Wednesday, March 1st, 310. We've been talking about school safety, and we, uh, one of the things we've been saying in committee is, gosh, it'd be great to get our heads around sort of a on-the-ground uh, understanding of how all this works. And Mr. Marino was kind enough. Uh, Mr. Marino, you're the principal, right, at the Williston Central School? Hi, I'm lead principal at the Williston School, so I support both Allenbrook um, uh, and Williston Central. Great. Hello, everybody. And we should ask him what his building was built. Just out of curiosity. Great. And so we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, we're going to take advantage of having you here, not only to talk about school safety, but we will also um, have a couple other questions for you. And we really appreciate it since we know you're on break right now. Uh, I don't know if you ever really get a break from the incredible work you, you know, you're committed to, but uh, we, we do appreciate you helping us out with our conversation around school safety. And your name was given to us by Dee Barbic, the director of the Violence Prevention Task Force, Vermont's director of Violence Prevention Task Force. So if you could just tell us, Mr. Marino, a little bit about your work and how your, your role on the uh, in your school and then also a little bit around uh, the role you play uh, as it relates to school safety that would be great certainly um, so my name is Greg Marino um, I am in my eighth year as lead principal at the Williston schools which is part of Champlain Valley School District um, for all that time, I have also served as the chair of the Williston School Safety Committee. I've also been involved as, uh, in co-leading the district safety efforts at CVSD um, with the chief operations officer. Uh, previously, it was Gene Jensen. Now it's Gary Marcris. Um, I have been a school administrator in Vermont, involved in school safety work for 16 years since I moved here with my family in 2007. And this is my 29th year in education. Wow. So in my role as um, the chair of the safety committee, um, the school safety efforts are, are a big part of um, my responsibilities. Terrific. So can you tell us a little bit about, you have a task force um, we don't have something called the task force. We have a school safety committee. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how it works? Uh, certainly. So, um, I think all of the schools in uh, CVSD have a similar type of team. Uh, in Williston, we have a uh, school safety committee that consists of staff um, from both Allenbrook School and Williston Central. Um, that staff is intentionally um, inclusive of classroom teachers, support staff, uh, technology experts, um, people responsible for um, running our access control protocol. In other words, people who work the front desk and buzz people in every day. Um, we have a mental health, uh, we have school nurse. We have partners on the town uh, as part of our committee uh, that is inclusive of um, the school library because they share um, a driveway with us. So um, the school library representative is there. Uh, standing members from Williston um, Police Department, Williston Fire. Um, we also have uh, the, the rec department director as part of the team. Um, and then our district um, facilities director comes and sits in on many of our meetings and our local Williston facilities director is part of the committee. We meet monthly um, for about an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half. And the purpose of our meetings is really to um, help support faculty and staff being um, in our systems and structures to be more prepared more aware and knowledgeable about school safety efforts um, and an effort to, to help keep everybody safe. So what if there, what would you consider to be uh, an incident or something where the, the group that you just mentioned um, needs to come together quickly? Okay, so um, the group that I just described is our safety committee 
And that is a little bit different than um, like our, our behavioral threat assessment team. Our safety committee is a standing committee that does, that works on the work. So we're doing the work um, around procedures, around protocols, supporting practices and drills around our options-based um, protocols, trying to give information to staff that they need to be successful and, and to build those skills. And then <clears throat> um, we've had a number of people that um, are on our safety committee, as well as other professionals in our schools um, trained to be part of our threat assessment team. So our threat assessment team, again, there's, there's carryover from some people on the safety committee. And then also we have other folks like our school counselors. Uh, I, I know I mentioned my nurse already, um, a school psychologist. And so those folks have been uh, trained in behavioral threat assessment. And then if something comes up, um, a concern comes to our attention where we are concerned that it could be a threat of, of violence. We then pull that team together. At first, we do an initial review because the, the protocol we've been trained in um, has a few screening questions that um, a small group, usually it's a few administrators um, and one or two members of that team that's been trained to do that initial screening to determine is a threat assessment appropriate. In this case, if so, then we pull um, a threat assessment team together and we run through the protocol based on the situation. And could you tell us a little bit about the protocol? Uh, certainly. Um, so uh, the first, as as I uh, as I for mentioned initially, there's there's a screening um, exercise, and that screening exercise asks you know first and foremost is this is this an emergency like is someone in imminent danger um obviously if it is you know you want to make sure you're following your procedures for that um and then beyond that it asks um you know is there a need to run an assessment uh, has the person threatened violence or made any other communication about intents to threaten violence or intents to do violence have these concerns um are they being experienced by other people? Um, have behaviors raised concerns about violence to self or others? Is there a fearful victim or third party? Um, and then, and then it asks: Does the student have um, a behavior intervention intervention plan, a 504 plan, an IEP plan, um, and or health plan? And then it asks some questions about whether or not the behavior could be a manifestation or a baseline behavior for a student on one of those plans. And that helps determine whether or not to run the threat assessment. And then the threat assessment itself, if we decided that it is appropriate, it just asks, um, first of all, it, it, the premise of threat assessment is to, to collect as much information um, before you're making, um, from the training, the, the phrase is collect the dots before connecting the dots. And so that phrase, collecting the dots, really speaks to um, bringing in as many people who have, um, you know, real um, on the ground daily knowledge of this particular situation. So people who interact with this person of concern or who, you know, this behavior of concern, people who interact with them daily. So we want to make sure we're talking with all of those people and not making any assumptions based on you know the report that came in so okay th th that could be the teacher who maybe the report was a result of something a student wrote in a journal where they wrote some explicit language around causing harm so that would that teacher we'd want to have that teacher at the table and ask you know ask about that we'd want to certainly talk to the caregivers of that person we'd want to talk to other people that that person interacts with on a regular basis, people who would notice changes in behavior, people who would have, you know, real day-to-day -day, um, information that was reliable about that person. And then, and then the, the protocol goes through and asks you to consider these various questions. I think there are 11 or 12 questions on the protocol. And at the end, 
um, of the process, it essentially asks, um, based on these, based on this information you've collected, based on the responses to these questions that the team has um, responded to, to the best of their ability, do you think this person could be on a pathway to causing harm, either to themselves or to others? And if the answer is yes, then essentially the, the protocol directs you to create an intervention plan. Um, and, and, and this part, frankly, as an educator, if a, a student, if a concern like this has come up where someone's wondering about safety anyway, um, you're likely going to create some kind of intervention for that student anyway. But this, when, when, when folks, when something comes our way that, that makes people think about, yikes, this student might be unsafe or I might be unsafe as a result of what I just heard or this other student is feeling unsafe, it has been very helpful to have a really objective um, process to sort of lean into um, where you can take a breath, collect the information, use the questions to objectively look at the situation and then at the end, build a plan of uh, intervention to support that situation. It could be in the form of like an educational support team plan, like an EST plan. It could be some other type of intervention plan where you're pulling in a um, variety of supports that the school has at its disposal. But what I have found about the threat assessment process is in moments where it could feel, you know, pretty uncomfortable and pretty uh, you know, you can get some pretty unraveled folks, understandably. It gives you this, this thing to turn to, this tool to turn to that's, that's very um, procedurally based. It's very objective. Um, not all the answers are crystal clear in terms of like, oh yeah, the, the eight people here all unequivocally agree the answer to this question is yes. It doesn't always work out that way, but at least it gives you a process to collect, to have the conversation, and at the end, um, this decision whether to build an intervention plan or not for the student. I hope that kind of get at your question. Senator Bueller, Senator Williams. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your testimony, um, Principal Marino. I was wondering how often your behavioral threat teams typically meet. Is this a rare occurrence? Is it more regular? And also just wondering if the assessment has ever ended or any of the assessments have ended in a suspension at all? That's a great question. Um, so or I can look, Okay, no, we have never ex expelled a student. Um, and uh, so the question about how often at Williston, I would say in the past, since we've been trained, so last year, half of this year, we have probably run four threat assessment processes, maybe five threat assessments in the last two years, um, four or five. In terms of uh, suspension, we don't use the threat assessment process as a way to determine our, our response to a particular behavior. The threat assessment process really helps determine the um, severity of a, a person causing potential harm or not, and how to intervene and build a plan of support around that to interrupt that. But regardless of the threat assessment process, we still have our code of conduct. We still have all of the responses to different behaviors at our disposal that we could apply or not apply. Um, we don't use the threat assessment process to determine whether or not we would suspend a student. Um, we would to make a decision to suspend a student based on the circumstances of the particular behavior. Um, we, we don't make those suspension decisions contingent upon a threat assessment. They're two, two parallel processes um, for that have slightly different purposes. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Yes. So do you obviously have this uh, plan written down? Uh, um, did it come from a, an experience someone had or from some, some uh, training? 
you know, obviously this uh, information gets condensed down to your situation from other schools where things have happened, but it, is it something that's on, uh, on your school website so people can look at it and so they understand what you do in a situation? Great question. Um, well, in terms of how we got to our, the process that we use is we were trained um, in the Sigma process. The state offered free threat assessment training for Vermont educators um, starting, I guess, a couple, about a couple of years back. Um, we took advantage of that training. Um, we had um, probably 16, 17 professionals from the Williston schools trained in threat assessment. Um, recently, I went um, also additionally took the train the trainer um, workshop that was offered this year. Um, so that feels pretty fresh for me. Which state agency? Of, say that again. Which state agency did the training? Um, it was sponsored by, um, you know, I, I, you know, it came from the AOE field memo, it was sponsored by the school safety center, but I think Sigma did the training. But you know, sponsored by the AOE, I believe. Okay. Um, I, you know, I was in the training with a number of AO, uh, Vermont educators. In terms of the process being on our website, um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think it is. I don't think the threat assessment protocol is posted on our website. Um, I don't see a reason why it couldn't be. Um, that would that could be a question I could bring back to my superintendent and communications director. So the reason I asked was that sometimes. You, it sounds like you've got a good plan. You've had some situational training exercises that were realistic. Uh, you do like an after action review after the situation and sit down and go, you know, we did this right, we did this wrong, and this next time it happens, this is what we're gonna do. And that, if it was in writing, then other schools that have, haven't got the protocols you've got might, might be able to get a hold of it and adopt it. Uh, I think that's a uniformity that I'm looking for. Um, yes. Yes, I mean, I think that's that's one advantage of um, having it become statute, you know, and that, uh, you know, you have a, a shared foundation of common training across schools um, and a, a shared, at least, framework for a process um, so people aren't having to make it up or, you know, call around, you know, send me yours, send me yours. It's It's here it is. Right. Um, absolutely. Thank you. You're very welcome, Senator Reese. Thank you. Uh, so good testimony. I'm curious uh, in your threat assessment process or in, in based on your experience, uh, to what scope do you have the parents involved in this process? Uh, to whatever extent that we can. Um, so most of the time that that means that they are quite involved, um, whether it is um, I can think of one instance in the last year where they were in the room with a larger team, actively participating, going through the protocol. Um, and that always feels good to me because it feels it feels transparent. You know, we we much like our ES, our educational support team process, it's nice to be able to say we have this protocol that we've been trained in to help support situations that that we that we come that we encounter with that where somebody could be at risk of causing themselves harm or somebody else harm. So it's nice to be able to say that we have this process and this thing that we've been trained in. So I, I can think I remember that day sitting in my office with that team and the parents being at the table and it didn't it felt very collaborative. Then in other situations, that where it's not practical practical or possible for the parent to be in the room, we would be having a separate interview with that parent, whether over the phone or in person, collecting the information, explaining what we're doing as, as the threat assessment. Um, so parents are involved to the extent that they can be. Thank you. Committee, any other questions for Mr. Marino at this point? It's very helpful, very helpful. We've been looking for some, you know, some understanding of how things are working in, in individual schools. Um, we're going to keep our going. We're going to have a walkthrough of a new version of the bill now. 
uh, and then we'll, you know, if you're able to, Greg, you know, we might be back in contact with you. We understand you're a busy person, but we might follow up with you and uh, ask you to testify again or weigh in on certain things. Uh, before you do go, though, uh, Senator Kulik, you're, I believe you're a senator, right? I am. Yeah, you're. you're oh, his, no, senator. it depends on where he lives. Yeah. I don't know where you live, Greg, but um, wondering when your school was built. Your oh, school, yes, Your question. school is the one with the blue roof, correct? That's one of our schools. Um, so I live in Williston, and that's which is also where I work, because I'm lucky enough to live there as well. So we have the two schools, Allenbrook School, which is pre-K through two, and then Williston Central, which is third through eighth grade. Allenbrook School was built in 1996, I believe, maybe 95, 96. And uh, Williston Central started in 1949 with a little brick section and has grown and grown since then, and a lot of iterations since then. Okay, thank you. The one that was built in 96 is in pretty good shape then? Um, well, we're coming up on 30 years and uh, it's uh, it's got its issues um, comparatively to what other school districts and locations are dealing with. I'd say it's in okay shape, um, but it's got its issues, um, especially related to building envelope. Um, the way the building was constructed really uh, didn't... Uh, give the attention deserved to the the exterior envelope of the building so we also happen to be in a little space crunch uh, right. as you may know yeah. be aware of with the demographics in williston yeah thank you very much you're welcome senator gulick is leading the charge on uh getting our schools uh those that need can can still continue to be renovated but really how can we get some new school buildings in this state for 21st century learning, and uh, it's we're hearing the, the need is there for sure. No, but that's for sure, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions for Mr. Marino? Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Marino. Right Good to see you. You are welcome. Thanks for this opportunity, and thanks for the work you do. Thanks for the work you do. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks. Is. I think going to be in here in a second to take us through a new version of the school safety bill. Welcome back to Senate Education, 3.36 p.m., March 1st. Ms. St. James, so based on yesterday's testimony from uh, P. Barbic, Ms. Seeley, and others, we have a new draft of school safety bill. I suspect it's not going to be our last, but let's uh, go through it. I'm going to make an opening statement, if I may, the, the purpose of it seems, and I could be reading it wrong, it seems like there's a lot that could be done to streamline some of these comments. In other words, it says, it says approved independent schools, and then it says the next one's public schools. Is there a way to sort of, I thought we were, publics and independents were all going to be kind of doing the same thing. I just want to make sure the, that matches the introduction. They, uh, they are. Okay. So, um, uh, and, and you can um, provide feedback to further um, streamline that. Great. Um, I do think it's... It's accurate. Uh, I think it's, uh, yes. So, um, that's St. James Office of Legislative Council, and I apologize, I do have a hard stop at four. Um, the no changes um, between the last draft you looked at and today are all highlighted in yellow. Okay, let's focus on those. So every, I will just say everything before the very end of page four and um, all of page five yeah. are changes made based on the feedback from the Vs. Yeah. Um, some of those are just small word choices. Um, most of it is adding approved or recognized independent schools and, and um, requiring a policy where public schools required a policy. Um, there are separate sections. So for example, um, under section 1481, which starts on page one and goes on to page two, subdivision A is um, applicable to um, public schools. And it talks about requiring the drills, following the guidance issued by the school safety council, et cetera. Um, and then subdivision B is for the um, Approve well, this still has language in there that is, I think, very broad, and I would encourage you to take testimony on the intent 
behind other educational institutions. What line are you on? 16? Um, 17. Okay. But um, each approved or recognized independent school shall adopt a policy, I think before it was procedure, mandating the school to conduct options-based response drills um, with the, the, consistent with the requirements of subsection A above. So just referring you back to A that has all of the requirements there. Okay. Um, and then because superintendents are different than heads of school, um, there's just that second line there about the head of the school does the reporting instead of the superintendent. Because some of those terms are not the same, um, I do think it makes sense to have like a public school section and an approved independent school section. Not all of the language is repeated. It okay. refers back to section A for the substance of what those schools have to do. Yeah. Um, you could certainly combine them all into one subsection. I just think it gets wordy. Um, uh, page three. Again, um, section two, emergency operations plans. There's an additional requirement for approved and recognized independent schools to adopt those um, emergency operations plans. Again, consistent with A, which is the public school section. Um, page four, section three, access control and visitor management policy. Um, Uh, an access control uh, shall adopt an access control and visitor management policy. Um, I think I added that language. Um, don't have to go back and look at the V's testimony on that, um, but it, that is what the section um, heading is. And then again, subsection B is a written requiring a written access control and visitor management policy consistent with subsection A for the approved and recognized independent schools. So we're not repeating out everything there, we're just referring back to subsection A. So there's, there's no requirement now to have an access control and visitor management policy? No, there is, that's oh. what this says. Oh, okay. Yep. And there varies, one of the things we heard early on, you may recall, a lot of this is happening in most of this, most, most many, many, many of our schools. Uh, and so this is trying to be consistent with us. Please. Um, the big change is on page four to section four, the behavioral threat assessment team. Yes, and section. this I asked you to add in response to the C leaks. Please go ahead. Correct. Um, so uh, the direction I received was to add language to make it clear that behavioral threat assessment should not be used for a punitive or disciplinary purpose, and then to require um, more specific data to be reported every year regarding. The behavioral threat assessment so I added subsection B on page 4 line 20 yep so behavioral threat assessment shall not be used for a punitive or disciplinary purpose a behavioral threat assessment shall not replace a manifest determination review for students on an individual education plan is required under the um, IDEA mm -hmm. and then I um, refer to the federal um, statutes there and then um, subsection C is annually each supervisory union, supervisory district, and approved independent school shall report data related to behavioral threat assessments to the agency in a format approved by the secretary. That language is already there. Yeah. Um, but what I added was at a minimum, the annual report shall include the names of members of the behavioral uh, assessment team was already there. Mm -hmm. And then so I added the number of behavioral threat assessment conducted in, in the preceding year and for each assessment conducted a description of behavior requiring an assessment the age and grade of the student requiring the assessment, the results of each assessment, and then the number of students referred for manifest determination review in lieu of a behavioral threat assessment. I did not, I think I caught the tail, very tail end of um, Ms. Selig's testimony on this, so I have not seen all of her testimony. Um, this is uh, based on our conversation, Senator Campion, um, and so certainly um, you can beef it up, beef it up uh, take things out um, as you see fit. Ms. Seeley, we have Ledge Council here for another uh, about 10 minutes, yeah. uh, so why don't we have you weigh in on this section. What would you like to have added to that data collection? Sure, so Rachel Seeley from Mount Legal Aid for the record. Um, so first, um, in terms of the data section, I would want to see added, uh, in addition to age and grade, gender, race, um, eligibility or non-eligibility for free and reduced lunch as a proxy for low income. Um, as well as disability status. Um, and disability status 
can include 504 or IEP eligibility. Um, I, your prior witness um, talked about uh, as well educational support teams, yeah. um, and I think I mentioned to you last time coordinated services plans that are you know encouraged under Act 264. And some students also have individual health plans that are operated by their nurse. It's not a substitute for a 504, but it may also be um, a, a piece of data about kind of the special needs of the student uh, who is who is subject of this. I would also be interested in whether a student is subject to repeated behavioral threat assessments, uh, as well as whether um, those plans have changed in the meantime. If a student is subjected to two or three or four behavioral threat assessments, was their IEP or 504 plan amended? Was their behavioral intervention plan amended? Uh, because it's not, the student is not necessarily the threat. The student is not necessarily getting the services and supports they need to have the behavior to be safe in school. Um, and, and I don't want this to, you know, as some of my prior testimony has discussed, result in tr treating the children as the danger. Right, like yeah. they deserve to be protected too. A couple of kind of um, uh, now is it off of this? It, it's still on this. Okay. But it, it's it's not on this list. It's it's manifestation determination review rather than manifest determination review, and um, it shouldn't just be IDEA. It should also be Section Five Hundred Four um, in terms of students with disabilities. Is uh, can I ask a question? Please. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Is um so I think. Is a manifestation determination review required under Section 504? Because so, if it's not, that's a, the committee that's needs to policy. understand yeah. that, and that's yeah. a policy decision. In Vermont, under our disciplinary rules, manifestation determination review is required okay. for both 504 and IEP students, as well as students who are being considered for those plans, okay. who maybe are not yet eligible. Okay, and so that's, that's based on Rule 4000 of okay. the State Board of Education rules. Okay. It's actually Section 4300. Okay. It's in the 4000s. Okay. Ms. St. James, is there any, I remember when we were doing data collection for other things over the years, is there any, you know, are we, are we in an area where it's, we can't get this information, anything like that? Do you remember when we were doing the school discipline bill, I think it was something we, we couldn't get, uh, yeah. we're okay? Um, so you're not going to be able to get identifiable information, right? Right, right, right. Um, no, thank you. I think most of this is already, re a lot of this may be required, especially if there's a um, an expense suspension or expulsion. Um, but I can cert I will certainly um, uh, ensure that anything um, moving forward, um, I don't have a concern about. Senator Weeks. I haven't formed my question yet. Okay. I've got one percolate. All right, all right. Kirk away. Um, let us know when you're ready. Um, committee, just thoughts? What do you think? What do you think? I, was, I was looking for a judicial committee oh. guy. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I have to, I have to think yeah, about this Yeah, more. yeah. Uh, being that it's on page four, line 17, we're, we're including local law enforcement officials. I'm just curious. Uh, what page, I'm sorry? Uh, page four, yep. line 17. We've yep. already written in local law enforcement officials as part of this uh, team. Yep. I'm just curious if uh, these reports, to kind of give the full uh, uh, landscape of, of, uh, of these, um, the need to initiate threat assessments. What about the, the legal, um, the law enforcement record associated with these individuals. You know, I mean, in some in some way, so we've got things happening in the school, we've got things happening outside the school. You know, there's gotta be a cross-pollination of some type or you've got, you know, we're stove piping. Uh, and I'm just, it's just a, just a theory. I'm curious if there's, how folks might think about that. With the help of breaking down some silos? Exactly. So it's not just the school recognizing that there's an issue that needs to be dealt with and, and how they deal with it and it's got all the uh, biographical data behind it, but 
you know, is this consistent with what's what's being potentially experienced outside the school? Are the same people who are uh, necessary to create threat assessments for? I mean, it just seems like uh, I'm not projecting, trying to project an answer. I'm just kind of asking the question. Are you saying that a lot of the um, by incidents of violence in schools has been perpetrated from without as opposed to from no, within? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that okay. the experience of what might be, the experiences inside the school might have a parallel outside the school. It's germane to the data being collected. Because right now I'm getting a sense that, you know, the, the, the um, uh, maybe the schools are being uh, accused of being a bit too harsh or too derogatory or too aggressive and in fact there's a whole aspect of what happens outside the school that might not be reflected in this, this, this song, so. yeah i i know i hear you and i having worked with teenagers my whole life i just uh they behave erratically and mm -hmm. i know beth needs to go i just um you okay for another five minutes yeah, it's a half till four. Okay, yeah, no, this is um, helpful, please. I want our schools to be safe, obviously, but I don't know. I Like, your story that you just told, that just, like, really is disconcerting. That number of threat assessments. To what end? I mean, were any of them real threats, or were they just kids being kids? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I guess I would want to know. I would say like, a subset of real, real. Real, okay. But you're worried. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, from where, yeah. in my world, where I live, we've been trying really hard to get sort of cops and law enforcement out of our schools mm. because of exactly the things that Rachel was bringing up. So, uh, mm -hmm. this, this is, I think about it. Yeah, we already have yeah. at least the uh, law enforcement's involved. Well, they're already at least written into a draft, right? right. You're into a draft. We don't you don't need have to, to have them as part of right. the team. Right, right, right. right. Senator Hashim, what are you thinking about this? Thinking of a lot of things, but they're still fermenting. In my yeah, mind. yeah. No, it's complicated stuff. I think what we're all trying to do is make sure that, correct me if I'm wrong, at least I'm hearing that we don't want kids misidentified, mis you know. For two years hearing testimonies about you know how serious suspensions and expulsions are what that does to a kid and that school to prison pipeline that really exists that I have to give credit where credit's due, the Texas Agency of Education, they were sort of in the forefront of that and they were some of the first to stop it. We don't want to, we don't want to do more of that kind of stuff. And yet, to what everybody else is also saying, is we want schools to be safe and we want to make sure that when threats are happening, they're assessed and with. And I think we'll get somewhere, but um, I'm understanding the complications mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. I, Please, yeah. I Let's just had a thought. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am wondering if anyone on, if this could help, maybe, yeah. if anyone on the behavioral threat assessment team if you could put it something in here about like mandatory bias training or mandatory some kind of training to, to sort of like to, to have the correct lens i'm going to use that word again going into this just to at least be aware of your own bias and aware of um some of you know societal biases that we've all lived in and percolated in our whole lives i just wonder if that could be helpful that was one of the suggestions I was going to offer to you kind of on the training piece was was not just training on this assessment protocol. And I think there's potentially also some room to say the agency has to designate which of these vendors are even allowable, right? Like we've done that with restraint and seclusion. There's only certain vendors that are like by default allowable trainers. So I think that's one piece because there are some models out there that are worse than, I mean, I don't like any of this. But there are models out there that are worse and are kind of more kind of otherizing of kids than others. 
Um, well, I just want to, I mean, you don't like any of it, and I understand. <laughs> it's, we're also, I mean, how do we keep our schools safe? How do we make yeah. sure, because, I mean, we, that, that's also something we're living the reality of. Right. Well, so when, when you were when you're hearing from your previous witness, the school safety committee, I have no issue with yeah. those. Like, I do think that kind of, like, yeah. ongoing process, I, I think the, the piece that I don't think actually keeps our schools safe is the targeting of kids and saying, this kid is a threat without kind of having, you know, and, and it sounds like theirs is a district that is maybe engaging yeah. in some really good practices that are not reflected in this language, right? Like, parents are involved. And they make sure to involve people who do actually know the kid. None of that is required in what you have here. Those would certainly go a long way to make me feel less bad about this. But do, um, do you disagree that at some point a kid could be a threat to a community? I think that's right, but I think mostly that comes from we didn't meet the kid's needs. Yeah, yeah. And so it's the upstream yeah. investment yeah. on yeah. positive behavior interventions yeah. and supports and restorative practice and preventing hazing, harassment, and bullying. And you know, yeah. all of those things. I think make it then less likely that we have 54 threat 58. assessments, 58 threat assessments in less than a year, right? Like that suggests to me that these kids' needs are not being met. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but yeah. I think it's a good time to say, all right, well, yeah. what are those reasons and how can we meet those needs rather than we haven't met these needs and so now we're going to say these kids are not part of our community and, right. and keep our make our community unsafe. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. To that end, are we going to acknowledge in this bill what we heard yesterday from Bor Yang around the correcting the standard, the severe and pervasive standard, and establishing a new one? You mean for harassment? Yeah. Yeah, but we can't do it. In okay, that's separate. I mean, we just there's just yeah. Right. Okay. We would do that. Hopefully, I mean, I hate to use their miscellaneous ed bill, but for us to get these three bills out, right, we gotcha. just can't jump okay. into that right now. All right. But I agree. It's it's something we definitely after crossover have to jump into. Yeah, I just I thought the Can't way she more. explained it was great, and yeah. it, and it was like a down an upstream investment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Events. And it, the other thing I would just put out there to everyone, including you, Miss Seeley, Seeley, is there. So what parts of this is there a part of this? If this committee, so something's going to leave this committee. Yeah. By crossover. Is there part of this that needs to be looked at, you know, during the summer or you know, in another way before we get to that? You sure. know, and that's the only. Thing. But at the same time, I don't want anything happening in our schools. Right. While and we do a summer so, study committee. While we do a summer study committee, right. and you know, that's a serious issue we know in the United States yeah. and in this state as well right now. Absolutely. So that's I think some of. You know, as we're all speaking honestly here, that's I think kind of what we're grappling with. We want our schools to be super safe, as do you. Yes. At the same time, we want to make sure that we are not harming the kids. Yes. I'm happy to think more about this new draft that Ms. St. James has put together, and if I have additional recommendations where we're not taking behavioral threat assessment teams out, but put in some more of the safeguards that I've like the trainings that are Like the trainings like kind of defining what threats are rise to the level of these threat assessment teams coming, to, coming together. Because I do recognize right? if a student is expelled, then we're just creating, we're creating a threats. bigger problem. Right, yes. your words, but yes, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. you're absolutely yes. right. Maybe. Often. I mean, I, I have to, I'll pull up the Texas stuff. It came out of judiciary, actually. They were the ones that found it. I mean, that school-to-prison pipeline was pretty dramatic for all of us over the past couple of years. Yes, With, it's pretty yeah. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. But we also want to make sure if, if there is a threat in the school, that threat is addressed. In, yeah. And as a middle schooler, my school had eight bomb threats called in in two years, right? Like, I lived through that. It wasn't pleasant. They stopped sending us home and started teaching us on the football field. Um, but there were never bombs, and so it like start, started like making us feel like this is a waste of protection. Until it really happens. What's that? Until it really Until happens. Until it really happens. Yeah. And then it's yep. yep. No, that's what we're trying to. Yeah, I agree. You'll continue to think about this. The St. James, go. Um, I just before I leave. Up. 
Would you like me to make an amendment to the manifestation determination piece um, in alignment with the state board rule? Yes, please. Okay. Um, Any other edits? And I'm for looking, this next and draft? I, I think let's put the other data collection information in there for the committee to respond to. So, as well as the secretary, the data collection uh, criteria outlined by Ms. Seeley. Okay. For and tomorrow. Then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll have the secretary weigh in and we'll let everybody think about this and try to. And I will ask Ms. Seeley to work with you and us to just keep. Get it so we can get somewhere on this. Okay. Do you want me to share language before tomorrow with Missy e. Lake? Um, realistically, by the time I get it back from editing, it'll probably be late morning or early afternoon anyway. Why don't we all look at it together? Okay. That's okay. That's, That's that way we can all okay. yeah yeah. Okay. So we don't get too many. I want everyone the committee to stay on the same page. Okay. I will make those edits. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. You're making me nervous. Tick, tick, tick. I have ADHD. I do have ADHD. Sorry. Are you staying on this? If not, I have another committee that needs to be. I think so. Okay. Thank you so much for Thank your you. consideration. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Rachel. So, anything right now on anything? Are we still on? Yeah. All right. I got something. We are on for a little discussion. Something yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Just something I want to say about what you said. Uh, you know, we've been trying to get police out of our schools for a long time. You know what? Back in the day when things were better in our schools, police would bring your friends. And, and we trained. They came in. They, you know, the students got exposed to them. They understood the good things they could do. And, and I think maybe in your neighborhood, maybe there's a reason for that, but in my neighborhood, it's not. Um, you know, and you, they can still have that authority and be in the school system as a police officer, and the kids can know that they are there without being any kind of a threat. They, you know, the city of Rock, they had a police officer that was a commander. He was on the front, you know, the blue line, he, he took his guns off and went to special training, and, and he was out there trying to de-escalate situations. Uh, so it can be done in the general public. It can also be done in the schools. So I just think that you know sometimes there's a lot of situations that happen in schools because there's no consequences for it. And they, everybody needs to understand that this, there is a consequence if you do this. And I, I think we've gotten away from that. So I just had to say that. I no, I, I really appreciate that. And we had SROs in our district that were really beloved by the community. And a lot of the kids loved them. And they were real positive. But at the same time, a few things. One is, you know, when I grew up, I think we had one kid of color in our, in our school. I mean, our, the Burlington School District, anyway, is... 50%, um, you know, BIPOC students, and I know Winooski is a majority minority school or district. Um, and it, as Rachel said the other day, it has it, it. There's data that suggests that people of color are more targeted than white folks when it comes to law enforcement. And for us, particularly in our district, we just had a lot of students coming from refugee camps who. When they saw a guy with a with a big gun and a you know a bulletproof vest and I mean that the equipment is intimidating. It was very scary for them. It was like it was traumatic and triggering for some of those kids. And then the other piece of it is that there, last I checked, there's not a lot of evidence that suggests police and schools actually make them safer. They just I have not seen any data that shows a direct correlation between law enforcement and schools and a safer environment. If, if, if it exists, I would love to see it, but we took a deep dive in this a couple years ago with around SROs and there just wasn't any evidence, sadly. But I think the relationship piece is important, I do, because you want to be building relationships between your community and your law enforcement. We did have, there was an SRO bill to remove them from all the schools a couple years ago, and 
we did hear a lot of pushback because like you said people love there are a lot of people out there all through the state that and it, it you can either add or get rid of an SRO tomorrow in your own district yeah. so we said okay we'll leave it to the local folks to decide and so no, it's you both have yeah good points okay anything else so we'll look at new drafts of this and uh, Ms. Lania said tomorrow, and we're also going to be looking at our pre K study language. Okay, we'll get there. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, see ya.